information. Let me out. let me tell you before we start. When you're in a bomber, when you're in a bomber, and you got flak going against you, and fighter fighter planes shooting you, you can't be nervous. You can't be nervous at all. After it's all over, you shake like a leaf. And there is a story that I want to tell about a personal, a particular bomber called a Lady Be Good. You might have heard about it. It was lost in the Libyan, in the Sahara Desert, and found 35 years after the war. No, but okay. And they found, and they found, out of the eight bodies, they found six of them, the bones, and these were all people I knew. And this was the bombing of the Palestinian oil fields at 50 foot level. At 16 hours flight from Benghazi to Palestia and back. 174 bombers left, 64 did not come back. My name is Sidney Rosen. In October of last year, I was 90 years old. I was born in 1916. I had a sister and a, a brother. My sister long passed away. My brother is still living. In 19, approximately 1925, my mother contacted tuberculosis. I was maybe eight or nine years old, it was pretty far back. My sister was about six and my brother was just practically just born. And my father was a tailor and he was the only bread maker in the, in the, in the uh, family. And uh, in 1930, she passed away and I was 14 years old. I'm sorry. It's okay. We're fine. Six months later, my father remarried. And from then on, my life went downhill. It wasn't a good marriage for, my, for the children. <clears throat> Eventually, my aunt, who was my mother's sister, which were both inseparable. Her name was Hilda Garfield. She took my sister in. And my brother and I stayed with my father. It was very hard. I graduated school at the age of 14. So you know I wasn't too good in school. But I had very little supervision. And uh, <clears throat> in 1936 or 37, after I lived with my grandma for a while and they passed away, I decided to go out on my own. And I went to work, I think, originally I went to work when I was around 14, 15 years old. And I never did, I graduated grammar school, but I never went to any other kind of school. And I worked. Never made much money, never had much money. I didn't drink, I didn't smoke. But I was a kid, you know. And I didn't know what to do with myself. And uh, the Germans at that time was making a lot of problems in Europe. And they invaded Poland. By this time, they were ready to do their bit against the, against the Allies. In 1939, they sent spies over to North Africa. Why? Very simple. They were going to invade North Africa, which was under the uh, rule of the French, and then they were going to drive down the coast a thousand miles 
and get to Cairo. Once they entered Cairo, they would immediately gone for the oil fields of Iraq, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. And at that time, that was 70% of the oil at that time that was found in the entire world. The only oil that the Germans had was in Romania from the Palesti oil fields. The Allies knew this, but the Allies, America was having their problem with Japan when they bombed Pearl Harbor. In 1941, after war was declared, they had the draft. And that's when I got lucky. My number was picked pretty close to the first. And I thought I never had a dime in my name. I had an Oldsmobile, never had a dime in my name. And I said, this is not good. So I have no home. I had a decent meal. So I says, and I never spoke to my dad about it. He had his own problems. So I made up my mind, if they're going to get me, I'm going into the service in what I want to do. Now I was five foot two, weighed about 110, 15 pounds. I was pretty small. And they all laughed at me. They said, they're not going to take you. They'll reject you. I said, well, we'll find out. I went into Clayton. Didn't take long, just a few minutes. And I already was in the service. Went back to where I worked, told them I was quitting. I lived in a one-room flat on Clare Avenue. I left there. And sometime around in December sometime, I went to Jefferson Barracks. In Jefferson Barracks, I was there a very short while. Meanwhile, the British Eighth Army was the only part of forces that the Allies had that was in the area of Cairo. There is a spot 150 miles west of Cairo called El Alamein. It's right on the shore of the Mediterranean. Now remember, the Germans had all the territory in the Mediterranean. We couldn't put any ships through there. This was when they attacked France and Dunkirk with the British and all the, most of the British soldiers that were in Alamein, they had to leave to go back to help their country. So the British Army was left with the Aussies, which was Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans, but mostly the, from India, the Sikh and Gurkha Indians, which were tremendous fighters. This was what they had. They had a few tanks, very few aircraft, and at that time, I, they got a, about 15 or 20 B-24s from the Burma area and brought them in and parked them in Lebanon so they wouldn't be too close to the main line. And this is where England said, we've got to stop them right here. Churchill got one of the biggest generals they had, General Montgomery. And General Montgomery came in and took over. Now, Roosevelt knew all of this, and he had to get help over there. And the only way he could get it was through West Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope, through the Red Sea, into the Suez Canal. We were shipped around sometime in December to Barksdale Field, Louisiana. And there we decided the 348th Service Squadron, which was going to service the 8th Air Force in that area. We were there a couple of months, and they got a few more B-24s and brought them down to Fort Myers. There they started their bombing practices, and we went to Fort Myers. 
Things were getting very hot up there, and the Germans were ready to attack. Now, I have to tell you, the first thing that was against the Allies was the Germans had got their one of the greatest generals, General Rommel, with his Africa Corps. Two of the most fierce guns and tanks the Germans had. To this day, we don't have anything like that. The 88 and the Tiger tank, they were very destructive. So the Allies had a rough situation there. So they had to get help, and they had to get help fast. So we went to Fort Mars, and funny thing happened. Uh, I was sitting in my tent at Fort Mars, and uh, this gentleman walks in, a soldier. And he says, anybody here from St. Louis? And I said, I am. He says, my name is Jerry Nodowitz. I says, the name sounds familiar. He says, I'm a uh, pilot with a B-24, and I'm leaving tomorrow for England. And I just wanted to see who you were, he says. And we sat for a while and we talked. And then, see, they flew, the, the B-24s would fly over there. But anything else had to be shipped over. Little did I know that three weeks later he was killed. <laughs> a beautiful man, a beautiful man. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am sorry. <laughs> it's not good for me to do this. this is <laughs> Your story, okay? It's all coming back. To and then it happens to you. I've never spoke to my family about and this. You know what never. This is why we're here. So when you gain your composure, we'll start again. It's okay. If we're rolling, it's fine. Now, we had to get ready to leave. I had a friend whose family lived in St. Louis by the name of Zimbalus. His name was Al Zimbalus. In 1922 or 23, they were a very religious family. There was two sons and four or five daughters. The family moved to Israel, and they bought a orange grove in B'nai Abrak, which is just outside of Tel Aviv, near Ramat Gan. And I knew where we were going because they had given us desert clothing. And I was afraid to write him a letter in the camp. I got out of camp and I went to Fort Myers and I wrote him a letter and I told him, I may see your family. Get back to me immediately as soon as you can and write me where I can find them. Well, by the time he sent the letter, I was on my way. They told me that if you want to see your parents, you have to see them by a certain, certain day. And we had a special kind of a train. Everything went off the track, and we were shot up to Fort Dix, New York. I saw my father for one hour with my brother. Then we got on the ship, and I was told it was the Louis Pasteur a French ship, but it was the fastest ship that the Allies had. It did 32 knots. Why? Because we were going to try to make the oceans without an escort. With all those U-boats out there in the Atlantic, that was taking a chance. When we got on the ship, all the shades were down. Nobody could see what was on the ship, but we noticed that on the top of the ship, they had fighter planes that were covered. We never got down below the deck. We didn't know what was on below the deck. And we took off. And 50 miles, and there was two U.S. destroyers on each side of us. And they were 
putting in depth charges all around. We knew there was there was U-boats there. Where did you take off from? New York. I remember seeing the Statue of Liberty. Fifty miles outside of the harbor, we heard a tooting or something, and the two destroyers left. They were on our own. Well, we were kids, you know. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't really know what was going on over there in the Middle East. And I don't know how many days it was, and we got to West Africa to a place called Dakar. We noticed that the ship did not go into the harbor, but other ships came out to us and brought us supplies, and we couldn't figure out why. In a few hours, all the supplies were loaded, and we took off down the coast. Now, this is sometime in early July of 1942. So you could travel around the Cape of Good Hope, and we were headed for Durban. When we got into Durban, we did go up to the, up to the uh, docks, and they let us out for one day. We were in Durban for one day, we took off, and went through the Sea of Madagascar, up into the Red Sea, and we got to a little port just outside of Cairo called, called uh, Port Chivik, it was called. And there, the ships came, little boats came, and they took us off into Cairo. That's when we found out what was on the bottom of that ship. Millions and millions of rounds of ammunition and bombs were in the bottom of that ship because if that ship would have exploded, it would have completely destroyed Dakar and God knows what else. Forget about us. We're gone. And that was it. We get to Cairo and they told us in a day or a day and a half, we've got to move up to Lebanon. We had a Jewish colonel that came to us in our tent and he opened up the cot bed. He said, I want to show you something. And he opens up a map. And he said, now this is the, the map of the shores of Libya and Egypt, all the way up to Tunis. This is El Alamein. This is where we are stopping. And at that time, the first battle of El Alamein started. Now, El Alamein's battle line was maybe a mile long from the ocean. But after that, there was no mechanized unit that could go through there. The sands were very high, and it would be bogged down. So that's why they picked this particular spot. He spoke to us. He says, I want to tell you why we're here. He says, if the Germans get to Cairo, you know that they don't have no problem. The Arabs will not help us defeat them. They will go right into the oil fields. He said, that is what the Allies do not want. But now it comes to the Jewish people. The Germans are in the midst of killing six million Jews in Europe. When they go up to Sinai and get to Haifa, which was the biggest, deepest port in the Middle East, this is where the oil was going to be shipped out of, what would we do with the half a million Palestinian Jews that are there? I don't have to tell you. It would be a second Holocaust. Then we realized what we were doing there. And now we were a little worried, you know. We got in this train. And we drove up through the Sinai, and we were riding one day, and I have to tell you, the heat is between 120 and 140 degrees. The humidity is a half a percent. We were going through, and we were supposed to pick up some water for the engine, and we noticed out in the the horizon, a black spot. And they kept saying it's a sandstorm. But it wasn't a sandstorm. 
when we got to this spot, and this I want to emphatically tell you, to remember that Palestinian Jews lived there in the early 1800s, and they worked with their hands, planting and planting orange groves and vegetables and all that kind of stuff. This is what we saw. The Arabs sitting on the side, smoking and drinking. The Jews with their big straw hats were out there digging away and planting and planting. In our outfit, we had a lot of soldiers from the south. And then we had a few from the east. So there was a little friction there. In fact, there was quite a bit friction there. When they saw what was going on, they kind of backed off a little bit. Here the Arabs have been here for thousands of years, haven't done anything. The Jews are here for 50 years, look what they're doing. I fell in love with this place. We had to get to Lebanon, so we kept going. We went up through the Tiberias, up in the, air, up in the air section there, and we got to a camp, and there's our B-24s. Maybe, I don't recall, maybe 15, 20, 25. And they all was happy to see us because they, we needed the bombing. They had to bomb all those supply ships of the Germans coming in through the Mediterranean. The, the, the fighter planes, they were all set up in, in, in Cairo and in Tel Aviv. At that time, Tel Aviv's airport was called Lud, the Lud Airport, which is now Ben Goyen Airport. So we were there, we were there and we started working there. Came a couple days before Rosh Hashanah of 1942, I went up to the uh, headquarters and I said, there's a few Jewish boys here. Is it possible that we could go to Tel Aviv and spend the first day of Rosh Hashanah there? And when we come back, we'll let the other people go and we will take care of the camp. And they thought this was a good idea. So he was given it maybe a two days before Rosh Hashanah, they got a hold of a truck with a Palestinian driver and we drove. <coughs> we couldn't drive at night, so we got to a kibbutz called Afakim. I'll never forget that. And we spent the, that night and that day, and watching those children dancing, all carrying guns, dancing and singing Hebrew songs, and tears come to my eyes. And I saw all the things that were growing there. And I said to myself, if I don't stay in the United States, I'm coming here. This is what I want to do. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'll make it or I won't make it. But if I do, and I don't stay in the United States, I will definitely come back to Israel. I have nothing else. So, it was the day of Rosh Hashanah. It was in the morning. Sometime around noontime, we got into Tel Aviv, and the truck left me off in Berea Brock. Now, I'm in a town where I don't know anybody. These people, the Zimbalist family, don't know I'm coming. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, I got a letter on the train going from there when we stopped to pick up our mail from Al Zimbalist telling me the address of his parents. And I stood there at the road and I, they said, we're going to be back here tomorrow at such and such a time. We've got to get back because there's a lot of action going on in the desert. Man walked, a young fellow walked up to me and he says, are you an American soldier? And I said, yes. He said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm looking for an A.B. Zimbalist. A.B. Zimbalist? What do you want A.B. Zimbalist for? And I explained to him why. And he got a hold of a young child and he said something to him in Hebrew and the child ran up. Here comes A.B. running down the road. Now he don't remember me because he was a small child then. And when he saw me and he hugged me and he took me to his mother and father. Now his father at that time had lost his memory and uh, they lost the orange grove and 
for him to stay in bed at night, they had to tie him down because he always wanted to run to shore. He was out of his mind. And they explained to me that, about this. Well, anyway, the next morning, we went to shore that morning, the first morning of Rosh Hashanah. And, uh, and it's just a little place with dirt floors and everything. And people were all out and seeing me. And uh, they gave me food that night, which I knew they didn't have. But I ate very little because I knew they didn't have that much. But we were happy to see each other. And I was happy to spend the time with them. Then I had to go back. And they picked us up. And right back, we went to Lebanon. No sooner we get back to our camp, it's two days later, we got into our B-24s and we flew to Tel Aviv, to the Lord Airport. And there we were there for about two and a half weeks. This time, the Battle of El Amain was in the second stage. And we were starting to move up. So I saw the Zimbalist family more than that. And by the way, one sh Saturday, I was walking on Allenby in Tel Aviv, and there was a brand new synagogue with a big dome. And I walked in, and maybe there was 15 to 20 Jews, and they were davening. And they looked up, and they saw me, and the davening stopped. They never saw an American soldier before. Well, do you know my brother, my brother-in-law from Brooklyn, or do you know my aunt from Chicago, or something like that? But they were very warmed with me, and I was with them. And uh, this was the thing that I liked about it. And I remember walking down a street, and I passed a Jewish bookstore. And I said, I want to buy a sitter and a Huguenotter for Pesach. I think I spent about $300 on this. But I couldn't take it with me because who knew where I was going to be? I had it shipped. Well, it was lost. I never got it. But at least I tried. After this was over with, I went back to camp and we left and we went to Cairo. Right, our air airfield was right by the pyramids and the Sphinx. And I spent a few days there, and then we took off, waiting up the highway. And as we went through the highway, we could still see the, the dugouts where the soldiers were, and the sandbags. And it just was a few weeks that we had passed there when there was fighting like this. But I like to go back a little bit. I know a lot of people who live in Israel, and I see them at the J, and I ask them the same question. Have you ever heard of the Palestine Jewish Brigade? They never heard of it. But on my 90th birthday, I had a kiddish at the Covenant House where I live, and one of the tenants there had a son, and it was her birthday to also, and she said that he was in the Israeli army later on. And I met him, and I said to him the same question. And he said to me, yes, I've heard of it. Were it this something to do with the Battle of El Alamein? I said, that's correct. But that's all he knew. That's all he knew, see. So this is one of the reasons why I see that people really don't know what really went on. Now, I want to go back a little more. When I wanted all my equipment to find out about all the things that I did, because I forgot a lot, they told me to go to the library on Lindbergh. I went on the library on Lindbergh, and I went up to a gentleman, a young gentleman, and I said, can you help me? He says, please. He said, what can I do for you? And I said to him, I would like to know something about the Battle of El Alamein. His chin dropped, his eyes lit up, and he says, I, well, why would you want that? And I said, well, I think 
out of 500 airmen, I think I am the only one left. And tears come to his eye. He said, this is my pet project. You are from the Battle of El Alamein? I said, I wasn't actually in the battle. I was helping out the battle with the bombers. He went through the entire Googles, because uh, I don't even know how to start a computer, not alone watch one. And he got me all this information, and I, I just read it. I read it, and things come back to me so quickly. And he didn't know what to do for me, and he got me most of the information. Then when I couldn't find out about my outfit, he got the information, and right now they are in the process of sending it to me. So now we go back to our first stop in the desert called Tobruk. You've probably heard of Tobruk. Nothing there, I mean, it's right along the shores. But it's a beautiful area with the ocean there. A lot of destruction. And there we did our bombing from there. We bombed the Palestine oil fields. We bombed anything we'd get our hands on. We bombed in Italy, we bombed Sicily, we did everything. And we were there. Now, from the time that I left Cairo till the time I got to Tunis was 18 months. So I was a long time in the desert. And in the desert, it's very hot. You cannot work on an airplane between the hours of 12 and 5. It's impossible. And the tents, we could not use American tents. We had to use English tents, which were double tents. During the day, I said, we'd be 20, 120, 140 degrees. At night, the water in your canteen was frozen. This is the kind of weather. But the nights were the most beautiful I've ever seen. Millions of stars up there. You could see your way in the middle of the desert. You could see everything. Anyway, we stayed in Tobruk for a few months. And then we moved on to Benghazi. Now in Benghazi, they said, you can have a week off. So I wanted to go back to Israel, but you have to get your own transportation. So you have to wait in the airfield until a plane comes and then you have to get permission to get on that plane and that's it. Well, almost at the end of the day, sure enough, here comes the British Halifax. Now, I want to tell you something. If I had to ride one of those again, I sure wouldn't. It's a plane made out of cloth. The sides are cloth, but it's a big bomber. And I rode in that, and I was sick from there on all the way to Cairo. But I got to Cairo, and I got to Tel Aviv, and I went to visit the Zimbalist family, and I made up my mind that I was going to take Mrs. Zimbalist out for the evening. So we made a date, and I got on a bus, and I rode to the bus station in Tel Aviv. We walked down to the theater across the street from where the synagogue is, and we had a lunch, and then I took her to the movie, and then came back home and left her off there. Little did I know that the bus stops at midnight. Now, I don't know how far I was from Tel Aviv, but it was a long way. I walked, and I finally got to the bus station at 5.30 in the morning. And my feet hurt pretty good, but I felt pretty good. And then I went back. Meanwhile, Mr. the old man Zimbalist had passed away, and I went back to Benghazi. We were bombing the Palestine oil fields regularly. And there was a big raid. It was run by a man called Killer Kane. I have the information on him. And it was a hundred and some odd planes that were left. And with the 88s, there was 90 guns, I remember this, in one mile area. And they were getting shot down left and right. So they decided to do the bombing at 50 feet sea level. Now it's a 17 hour flight from Benghazi to the oil fields. 
and back. And if they had to fly real high, they have to use mask, like oxygen mask. So they flew this at 50 foot levels. As like I told you, 64 or 67 didn't come back. One plane called the Lady Be Good was in our outfit. There was eight men on that plane. I don't recall their names, but I saw them every day. They didn't come back. We would stand and watch when they came in. They didn't come back. And the reason I'm saying this is, after I came back to the States and I got married, and I had an auto parts store in North St. Louis, around, I would say, 35 years ago, a band of Arabs was walking in the Sahara Desert and saw this airplane, and it was the Lady Be Good. So they got a hold of the authorities, and they came up there. The, the uh, Army and the Air Force came out there, and they went through the plane. The water in the canteens were still there after 35 years. They didn't find the bodies, but they found the bones. They found the bones of six of the men. They never found the last two. So they had, they flew in some mechanics from McDonald Aircraft in St. Louis, and they went to the Libyan, to the uh, Sahara Desert. See, when you're flying at nighttime, you think you're over water, but you could be over sand. And this, and they were shot up something terrible, and all their instruments were shot. And this is why they went 350 miles south of the Mediterranean. They brought back some of the engines. I never saw them, but I knew they were at McDonald's. By this time was the time when I retired from the business, and I never followed up on that. I wanted to bring that out to you. Now it's getting close, and uh, uh, the United States, and, uh, and that by this time, uh, England was fighting for their life, became D-Day. D-Day, and we were bombing like crazy, and ships were not coming back, and men were getting killed. And then we heard rumors through the grapevine and through the uh, uh, paper that we got of the Jews being slaughtered in Europe. And uh, all of a sudden, they start bombing Sicily. And we knew that the time comes for them to invade Italy because D-Day had started from England and then we had the Battle of Anzio. And uh, then we knew we were going to uh, go to Italy. Uh, well, we have a movie on, in the desert. They get a generator and they show a movie and there's hundreds of soldiers there because they have nothing to do. One day they were playing a movie. It was called Suez with Tyron Power. I'll never forget it. And something happened to the projector. And I said, I think I can fix it. Because I used to mess with projectors. And I fixed it. Little did I know what this was going to do for me. And we had the movie. But now we're talking about a movie. There was a movie in the early 40s called Five Graves to Cairo with Frank Chateau, now I forget the name of the main actor, and I will, say, I will think of him. It wasn't graves, it was depots, it was all supplies every few hundred miles in the ground, water, ammunition, whatever they needed. George Raft is the name of the man. And this was called the Five Graves to Cairo. 
And I remember that to this day. And somebody mentioned that to me the other day, although I haven't seen the picture in years, you know. And I wanted to bring that up. And this was a story of that. Uh, also, uh, came time for us to go to Italy. And uh, uh, we got on a C-47, which is a transport. And it took us to our base in the heel of Italy. And that's where we had our main base. And we got settled there, and we got plenty of, of crews coming in, plenty of crews all this time that we were in the desert. Once we got into Tunis, by the way, by that time, the Americans had come in on North Africa with Patton, and he was a main general, and they got together, and that's when they completely defeated, and Rommel went back to Germany, some way he got away, and uh, uh, they, that's when they defeated the Germans then. But when we got in Italy and we got settled, they called me into the office and they said, Sid, we want to ask you to do a new job. And I said, uh, I said to myself, can't be worse than what I'm already doing already. He says, we have a lot of soldiers here and they need some relaxing. We're going to have two theaters. We want a theater on the camp in the summertime. And we have a theater in a little town called Gritaglia, up in a hill about a mile and a half away, where we can confiscate this theater and we can have the theater at night uh, in the wintertime. We would like for you to run both of those. And beside that, while you're doing that, you can take care of the PX for us. And I said, great, I'll be glad to do this, glad to do this. So we found a big bombed out hangar, and I had the pictures of that here. And we had a lot of, of uh, different uh, 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 fellows that one worked on the propellers, one worked on the engines, different, they were, they were like in big trailers. So we, cleaned off the, the front of the, the theater, the ground, and got that straightened out. And we built a stage. The carpenters came and they built a stage. And we put up a screen. And what did they use for a screen? Parachute cloth. Put that up. I have the pictures of that. Then we decided what we we're going to do because we can't have the men standing up. Well, the 500,000 pound bombs come with protection metal on each side. So they took each sides off. We had piles of them all over, took those and made chairs out of them. We had 500 chairs. Then they built me a little booth in the middle, and then they gave me two RCA 400 sound projectors. And they, electrician, we had that built so there would be no interruption between the reels. And we had movies. Of course, in summertime, the movies would start after it got dark. But in the wintertime, when we were in the, and then if we needed afternoon, we would have the afternoon shows in the theater in town. And this kept the boys happy. We always, everybody would always come up to me and say, hey, Rosen, what are we playing tonight? You know what I mean? And uh, it, was, it was a wonderful thing. I mean, the boys, uh, they had a relaxation. Oh, are we seeing this picture? Oh, we didn't see this picture. And I said, you got to see headquarters for this. I only get the pictures, see? And um, this is what happened. And that was another 18 months in Italy. Uh, by that time, I was over three years. And I had so many points. I think you needed like 45 or 50 points. I had like 200 points, but they weren't sending us home. But by the time the, uh, the Germany had quit, uh, that uh, uh, they were starting to send the guys home. And that, by that time, we were overseas almost three years. So I'll never forget it as long as I live. Oh, I have to tell you, I have to go back to something that I had forgotten. When we were in the desert, you had to park your planes pretty far each way from each other. Now these are four big engine bombers. And when I get in the seat, I can barely see it over the top of them. They wanted one of these bombers moved from here to 100 feet over there. And I said, fine, fine. I got in this bomber seat, 
started the two inboard engines. And I'm going down a little runway there to get there. And a guy hollers out, the plane is going and nobody's in it. And finally left, you know, but parked the plane. Don't ask me to do that again because I couldn't do that, see. Now, I mentioned something at the beginning when I said I was about 115 pounds, five foot two. I was the only man in the outfit that could get into a bomber into the wings because the hoses going from one gas tank to another had clamps on them and they would become loose from the vibration. So I had to put on a special kind of a suit, no metal whatsoever, no metal on my shoes, everything had to be covered, a rubber flashlight, a rubber screwdriver, and an oxygen mask. And I could not stay in that plane more than 15 minutes. If it was 135 degrees out there, what do you think it would be in that plane? And I would go in there, and I would tighten up some of these bolts, and you could hear the guys hollering, hey, John, you got a match? And that's part of the funny things. And I'm a little nervous in there, I'll tell you that now. Of course, I'd say if something happened, it would be real quick, wouldn't it? <laughs> So anyway, I'm going back to the time when we were leaving. Now, I had made some inquiries about Israel. Oh, by that time, it wasn't Israel. It was still Palestine. What I would have to do if I wanted to go back to live there. Because I didn't know what was going to happen when I got back to St. Louis. Well, I got awful sick passing the... Uh, Rock of Gibraltar on the way home. It was very deep, and I don't know what happened, but I got pretty sick. And I was sick for about five days going across the ocean. All that flying that I did, I didn't get sick, but this time I did. We're out on the ocean, and all of a sudden, the, the uh, big general gets on the intercom and says, I have some good news and bad news. I say, well, what is it? He says, well, he said, the good news is you're going home you're going to have 30 days off and enjoy yourself. He said, the bad news is where you're going to Japan. That didn't go too good with us. But like what happened was, by that time, the atomic bomb came in and we didn't have to go back to Japan. Well, I want to go back a little further. When I went into service, I went to my aunt. And I said to her, here's $250. Start a bank account. And I'm going to send you all my allotment money in. If something happens to me, you take the money and split it up amongst my brother and my sister. And that's all I said. Nothing in writing, nothing like this. She was an angel. So on the way home, I got home. I got to New York, and oh, I can remember, I, going back a little further, when I was in Afakim, even in those days, they took me up to like a water fountain, and milk was coming out of it, like a water fountain. Milk was coming out, and I hadn't had milk for that, and I didn't have milk until I got back. And I drank so much milk when I got back to New York, and I actually got diarrhea, see? So... Uh, I got home, and naturally my father, my brother, my brother was in the service. Uh, my, my sister, her husband was in the service. So it was just my father, my stepmother, and my aunt and my uncle. And the whole family came over and everything like that. And uh, I went over to my wife. She wasn't then my wife. I had no idea I was going to marry. I knew I wanted to marry her, but I, I didn't know and picked her up and brought her over. And uh, I know my dad loved cigars, so I brought some cigars with me. My uncle liked cigarettes, so I brought cigarettes with me. They were stale by the time I got back home, but they, they smoked them anyway. And uh, my aunt comes up to me and she says to me, here, this is yours. And she hands me a bank book. 
and I looked at it. There was $8,000 in this account. I never had eight cents in my life outside of the $250. This is what I had saved because I never used anything. I was always broke when I was, but I, I knew my money was going in good places. So I had money. So I said to my girlfriend then, it was just before the holidays of the six weeks of June or something like that. By the way, I came in the end of May, the first part of June of 1945 is when I came home. And I uh, said to her, you want to get married? And she hesitated. And I never told her nothing about going back to Israel or anything. I never told anybody this. This is the first time I'm talking about it. I always make a joke about it because I told her I had $8,000. She said, get the rabbi. But she didn't say that. And I said, I want to give you a watch. And she says, is there any strings attached to it? I said, well, if I'm giving you a watch, there's got to be strings attached to it. To make a long story short, we got special permission from the city of St. Louis to get a blood test. And the only rabbi left in St. Louis was Rabbi Achenstein. He was the chief rabbi. And we got married. And right after that, I was shipped to Kelly, to, uh, Kelly Field in Dayton, Ohio. And from Kelly Field, I went to, uh, to uh, Randolph Field in San, San Antonio, Texas. And sometime in October of 1945, I was discharged from the service. <clears throat> now these are my story, and this is the first time I've talked about it. With all the problems that Israel has had, I felt that I wanted to give it to him because it was a possibility there would be no Israel. Okay, I want you to tell me more about El Amin. You know? <laughs> Well, like I said, I wasn't there, but I saw enough of it. It was a very bad... Oh, by the way, the reason I brought up the Palestine Jewish Brigade, their graves are lined up all over the North African coast with the Jewish Star of David. And if anybody says there was no such a thing, I would like to live to see this. What did you hear when they were talking during, during the time of the battle? What would you hear? Oh, we were hearing that it was life and death. It was life and death. It just happened to be that two things. You couldn't be smarter than Rama was. But what happened was they ran out of fuel. They ran out of all kinds of supplies. And that's why they beat them. That's why we beat them. Why well, I could say we, they beat them. And when the bombers came in and all the bombing going on, it was more than the Germans could handle. And like I say, God works in funny ways. In funny ways. When I talk about the Russian stand in Stalingrad, did I speak about that? I mentioned with that before. That was the year, was the worst and coldest year that Russia has had in hundreds of years that they kept time on. The Russians had knew the kind of clothing to use in this kind of a weather. The Germans didn't. It was so cold that the bodies were frozen to the tanks. And to kill a million men in that time. And when was this? This was in 43 or 44, I'm not sure. Not sure. And uh, all I can say is I met a lot of these Palestinian Jewish brigade soldiers. They were rough. We could use a few more of those. They were rough, but they were good. And the people, I don't care what anybody says, the people there deserve everything that they got coming to them. So has there 
been talk about, I know you feel very strongly that, you know, had, had El Alamein not been won, that Israel would have been taken over. A child could see this if you looked at the map. All you got to do is look at the map. Where was the Israel, go, where was the Germans going to go with the oil? And you know that going from the oil, there would be a lot of, 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 of the Jewish people would be fighting back because this is their life. They would destroy them. This is all, it, it was just played as on the nose of anybody's face. And this is what, and when I saw what the Jewish colonel said, I saw that I didn't have to question it. It was there, it was there. Because the Arab people, don't get me wrong, there's some good ones, but the Arab people go with the winner. If the Germans would have got in, they would have gone with the Germans. See? So, I would say that they would either have been slaves, the Palestinians would have been slaves, or would have been eliminated. What would be another half a million Jews to be killed? You got, at the Holocaust here, that should answer your question, without a doubt. And I felt and I want the Jewish people to know this. This is just, just not something that just happened. It happened. Like I say, God works in mysterious ways. And if he killed a million Jews or six million Jews, he must have had a reason for that. Seventy-five percent of these Jews that were killed in Europe would have probably ended up in Israel anyway. See? And they had plenty of problems there because during World War I, Palestine was turned over to the British mandate. They didn't want them. They had their own problems. So it was once the British got out of there, you know what went on between the, the Palestine and the, after becoming Israel, what happened to the Palestine, the Israel people and the Arabs, say. Would you ever think of a mother or a father taking their child, wrapping them up with explosives and sending them out to kill people? We wouldn't even think of that. We wouldn't even think of that. We would die for our children. Absolutely. And you, ser you served everyone well by going there out of, you know... To think of a man like, like Jimmy Carter would say something like that and go with the with the with the Arabs, it's ridiculous. I am sorry I voted for him, and I th and I say to him, I say to myself, shame on you, Jimmy Carter, shame on you. Well, hopefully we'll all learn a lot of a lot of lessons from our past history, and um, and move forward. All I would be happy. I don't have much time left. I want the Jewish people to know. What's involved here? I want to talk. I want to talk to the Jewish people, the men and women who run the country, the Knesset. Put all your things aside. Get together and do something for your people and your country, because this is the last place you'll be if you can't make it work. <laughs> You have to do something. You have to. People have to live together. Enough killing is enough. Enough killing already. Um, I think we've gotten it. Is there anything else? No, I'm happy to the people that I live long enough to tell this story, and I would like for people to know of your fellow man. I am not a hero. I believe me, I'm not a hero. I don't want to be called a hero. The graves along the North African coast. Forget about all the the other battles. There was many of people were killed in the in the Pacific and in Europe and all that. Remember, I I lost a little thought here, but what I want to say is, all you have to do is the heroes that are laying in the graves in North Africa, they are the heroes, whether they be Israelis, Indians, 
Aussies, New Zealands, whatever they are. They won the battle. The airmen helped win the battle. We were a link in the chain. All, all we really need is peace, right? We, the Jewish people, this is what they get. You know why? They are looking for peace, living with their neighbors, raising a family, and living out their life to the fullest. This is what the Jewish people are. And all around Israel today, they hate us for this. They hate us for this. This is the situation. God knows it will not happen in my time. But it's got to be, something's got to be done or else it won't be worth it. I don't know what God has in mind, but I'm sure he does. I'm sure he does. And I can say to the people, I would like more people to listen to what I said because I don't want to, well, there's an old story. Yeah, hold on. There is two words that the Jewish people have to say, never again, never again, when we will kill six million Jews, never again. Uh, I want to thank you, Sister Prince, this gentleman here, and everybody involved, I'm not doing this for myself. I want the people to know the story. And I forgot to say, I meant to say this. I, I'm sorry I left it out. You can say it now. Say it now. I have two children. I forgot about them. Start over, say, I have two children. I have two children. I have a daughter, Vicki, who is living in San Francisco, who is with the Environmental Protection Agency. Her husband, Randy, is with the Food and Drug Administration. 35 years he's been there. He is the one that solved the problem this summer on the poisoned uh, f uh, vegetables that was causing deaths in California and he got it straightened out so he knows what he's doing a very smart man and uh, I'll never forget it uh, uh, he knows an awful lot about uh, medical problems and I've had some few I, people will ask what is this thing right here this started with cancer of the skin in the desert. We never knew about melanoma at that time, so they thought it was a bug bite or something. Well, 15 years ago, it came back, and I thought it was a bug bite. To make a long story short, I had five operations in four hours, and each time they operated, they get deeper and deeper to get the cancer out of it, and they couldn't get much further than that. I'm lucky I'm alive today. I cannot be in 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 uh, in uh, uh, the uh, 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 sun at all. And uh, remind me, I have something to say about the uh, Jewish war veterans. Uh, so I said to my son-in-law. I'm having a problem, you know, I'm having a problem, I'm bleeding, because I was taking Coumadin. So he said to me, you know what you do, Pops? He says, you eat whatever kind of a cereal you got, you eat a couple of, uh, of uh, prunes. And once or every other day, you take a little bit of olive oil. You'll never have a problem, so I went to Dr. Saltman, my doctor. I walk in and he says, how you doing, Sid? And I says, oh, I'm doing fine. Well, how's the bleeding? I says, thanks to you, I'm doing okay. And I tell him about my son-in-law and what I should do. He says, so? I said, so if that's the case, what I need you for? See, so this was a situation. And they have no children. He has a, ch a girl 
who lives in the apartment downstairs from them. They own this house there in San Francisco. And she works with, uh, with uh, troubled children. She's in her early 30s. <coughs> My son, who lives in Oklahoma City, he has two boys, one from the first marriage and one from the second. The first marriage, uh, he is in the service. He was in, he was in, uh, in uh, Iraq. He got married, went to Iraq, came back, and he listened to me, and I told him to make the service his career. He needs only six more years, and he will be out of service. He has a two-and-a-half-year-old boy and another one coming. The youngest son is a funny situation. Good-looking kid, about 29 years old, always liked to play with airplanes. Well, let me tell you something. He is now a jet pilot for a big corporation called the Nobel Foundation in, in Oklahoma City. He's not married. He's going with a nice girl. And he said to me, he asked me some questions. He said, you know, you asked, so, uh, he wants to learn things because he knows his grandpa knows quite a bit. And he says, I was thinking of going with Southwest. And I says, don't do it. Jordan, don't do it. He says, why, Grandpa? I says, I'll tell you, you're making plenty of money where you're at. Whenever you go to a town, they give you, you have a credit card, they give you a car, you do whatever you want, you're making good money. If you go with the, with the big Air, Air Force, with the big uh, place, you don't know when you're going to be laid off or not. He stuck, listened to me, and he stuck with it. And he said to me, tell me, Grandpa, if I was with a pilot with Southwest Airlines and you happened to be on my plane, what would you think? I said, the first thing I think I would get off. <laughs> and I get a kick out of that. Yeah. He heard about this tape and he wanted to know about it. I talked to him yesterday. And he flies every day. And once in a while he stops in the St. Louis. Okay, well give me, I want a shorter version of just say, you know, I'm very blessed because I have two children. Give me their names and give me the names of your grandchildren. Okay. I... What you, very lucky. How are you yeah, yeah, very fortunate, very fortunate, because I, my, my oldest grandson is around 33, my youngest grandson is 29, my, my daughter, she don't want me to tell her age, and my, my son is around, uh, he was born in 50, so you figure it out, and uh, uh, they are, are my life and dream. My wife, who were married for 60 one and a half years. That is one of the best things I ever did. We fight a lot, but we love a lot. And we live in the Covenant House because I have been retired for 28 or 29 years, and I'm living on the same income that I did before, and it's a little rough. But we're happy in the Covenant House, very happy, and uh, life is great. And every day we wake up and we have a little pain here and we have a little pain there, but we, we make it do because other people are worse off than me. And uh, I want to say something. We are here now in the Jewish War Veterans Memorial Room. And I have been a member for about three, four years. I belong to 346. There's also 644. And in a short while that I have been here, they have done absolutely fabulous with the money that we had taken in for the poppies. I cannot help with the poppies anymore because I can't get in the sun. But the last time I did, I took myself took in $1,000. So we, sir, a few years ago, we gave the... Uh, the uh, veterans, we gave them some kind of a furniture where they serve refreshments in. We gave them that. Last summer, we delivered a snow cone machine to the USO at Lambert Field, and they in turn took it to uh, 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 the uh, Army base in, in, uh, in Missouri. Uh, Scott. Scott. No, not Scott. The other one. Uh, Fort, Leonard Fort Leonard Wood. That's right. And uh, they're having a ball with it. But here's the big thing. We took in a lot of money this last year in the poppies. 
and we've been saving our money. And through the Ford Motor Company, we purchased two 2007 Ford vans at 12 seats each van that cost over $31,000 a piece. That's $62,000. But through the Ford Company, they gave us a discount. These vans are to be delivered to the veterans, to the Jewish War veterans, the 346 veterans, in March. And they will be presented to the veterans of Jefferson Barracks and Grand Avenue and the veterans' home in North St. Louis to be used. That's their vans. They have uh, uh, volunteer drivers for this, and they have special equipment for people who have trouble getting on vans and off the vans. And they will be used to take these people to the doctor, to the hospital, to whatever they need, and this is what we are doing. And I want to say something to the people of St. Louis. All of us are older people. We're on our 80s and 90s. And a lot of them are sick, and we're having fewer and fewer, and more, a lot of them are dying. We are running short of help. We need new blood to come in and join the Jewish war veterans, whether you join the 346 or the 644, it makes no difference to help us because sooner or later, there's going to be a time when there won't be nobody left. And then what are we going to do? At one time, we were in Benghazi. We got a notice that a sandstorm was coming. And we had two hours to accomplish something it would take maybe a half a day to do. All the airplanes had to be covered. The exhaust systems had to be covered with cloth so no sand would get in. Then we took rope and we put it from our tent to the latrine and to the commissary. All everything was tents then. There was no buildings. And for four days, we slept with a gas mask. And this is where I think I got my asthma from, from the sand. And at that time, we were joking about it. But the sand was so bad that I could not see you where you're sitting right now. And God forbid if you let go of that rope. Oh, one thing happened which was funny. We have to pull guard duty no matter what we do. So I'm out there at 2 o'clock in the morning guarding a B-24. And I hear a noise. Well, right away I cocked my gun. And uh, as I turned around, it was a camel, and we both hit at the same time. Well, that camel got more scared than I did. He run yelling like crazy in, out into the sand, and I was shaking pretty good myself, see. But this was a funny thing that happened. That, uh, few, not too many things happened, but there was a few things that happened. It was all right. And we would watch to see how hot it was, so we would take an egg. Now you figure out where we would get an egg. We ate nothing but eggs because the Arabs would come up to us and they would sell us eggs for 50 cents a piece and we were glad to buy them. So we would take the eggs and we would put them in our, in our, in our uh, helmet with water, heat them up and have hard boiled eggs. And uh, uh, this is what we ate a lot of times. And... Uh, uh, so, uh, like I say, it was, it was fun, but I have a picture here of a gentleman from New York. His name is Joe Stein. He was a very religious man. He brought his thriller with him, and he davened every morning. The only thing he ate at this, at the camera, no matter where he was at, all through Libya and all through Italy, fruit, coffee, powdered milk, uh, bread, eggs, no meat, potatoes, vegetables, but no meat. The one thing I want you to tell me is 
to reiterate, you talked about using this tape at the museum. So what I want you to tell me is how important you feel that the Holocaust could have been so much worse if you hadn't won the battle. Oh yeah, there'd have been a half a more million people killed. Well, tell me, tell me if the battle at Alamein start with that. About what? If the battle hadn't been won. Oh. Oh, I need you to say it. Then, well, I can say this. If, if, if the Germans would have broke through and got the oil, and what they would have done with the Palestinian Jews, you, you use your own imagination, maybe they would have been in Israel, but it wouldn't be that fast until the Germans, meanwhile, you're killing another half a million, and meanwhile, the Arabs are taking over the land. So, what chances are to get the land back? This is this is what the what the, the Palestinian Jewish Brigade was fighting for. They weren't fighting for the British. They hated the British because of the British being the uh, the governor of uh, of of Palestine. But they were, but the British. It's not to the British fault because they were elected by the United Nations after World War I to take off the, over and run the, the, the country of Palestine. It's in, the, it's in the, uh, the news there. And it only takes, one and one always makes two. And there was no other way out of it. And it's surprising that the younger people today who come from Israel don't know about this. Now, my rab our rabbi that runs at the, covenant, at the Covenant House, Rabbi McGenzie, he just came back from Israel. And I asked him when he went there, I said to him, I said, uh, see if you can find out anybody that knows anything about the Jewish, the Palestinian Jewish Brigade. Well, you know, he's there to, for a wedding and his family's there, his sister's there. And, you know, he has other things and I guess he didn't, you know what I mean? But... Uh, uh, what I'm really trying to find out is about my outfit. And my daughter talked to him long distance the other day, and the woman said, we're on it right now, we're on it, see. But uh, I wanted to get some more information later on about it. But, uh, What's the name of your unit? The 348 Service Squadron with the uh, 8th, Air, Air, 8th Air Force. The 8th Air Force was, well, there was the 9th Air Force was in England, and the 8th Air Force was began in Barksdale Field, Louisiana, and I read in the article the other day that it was disbanded, and then I think it's been brought back since the Gulf War, see. But uh, this is about the only thing that I, I can't remember of anything else. Do you think we... I think we got it all. I think we're good. <coughs> You know, I'm kind of an emotional person, and uh, I can't help it because it comes from here. But I want to tell you why we're doing this, and for what reason we're doing this. In 1940, 1939, 1940, the Germans had invaded North Africa. Why? There's nothing in North Africa. But in the Middle East, Iraq, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, at that time, it was 70% of the oil that was was found was at that time was in that area. The Germans had to have that oil. The only oil that they had was the oil of the Palestinian oil fields in Romania. So they needed that oil. Now, it's a long story, but I'm going to try to sharpen it. In 1941, right after Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt and Churchill had a meeting. I don't recall where this meeting was at. But it's right here in an article on that side that was sent to me to the first person 
who took this program and worked with me on it. Her name is Sister Prince, and she's here today. She sent me this article. I'll talk about the article very shortly. But anyway, the only place that the Allies could stop the Germans was in Al Alamein. Now, people don't know about Al Alamein. There's a map right here. It's 125 miles west of Cairo. Nothing there. But a perfect spot to put a stand. To the north of the El Alamein line was the Mediterranean Sea. The line was about two miles long. To the south was the sand dunes. No mechanized units could go through there. So they had to stop them right there. Because once the Germans get through this line, <coughs> the right flank goes and collects the oil. Now where is the oil going to go to? Only one place. The port of Haifa in Palestine. Now there's a half a million Jews living in Palestine, who have been living there since the early 1800s. And when they got there, these were people who were not wanted any place on the earth. And they moved from Europe, from East Asia, from all over. And it was a barren land, nothing there. And with their hands, and with their heart, and with their strength, in 75 years, till the time that I got into Palestine in 1942 of July, they worked with their bare hands and made that a place that it, you couldn't believe it. In 1942, I was amazed what I saw. Now the Arabs, they hadn't done anything for 3,500 years. So all of a sudden when they see what the Jews have been doing, they want Jerusalem. They want Israel. They want the entire thing. It's easy for them. You know, God helps only those that help themselves. So this was the whole story. Now, the Palestinian Jews knew that they are not worried about the oil. The oil was not their problem. They knew what was going on in Europe. They knew that there was killing going on. We had knew very little about that. What we got from the Stars and Stripes was all that we had. But they knew what was going on. And they were in the process of killing six million Jews. So what would the Germans have done? When they got the oil to Haifa, they would have killed every Palestinian Jew in the place. I guarantee you they would have put up a fight. But there was no chance in the world that they could make it. So I just wanted to bring you up the story of what this is. Now, I told you about Roosevelt and Churchill talking. Meanwhile, we were invaded in, in Hawaii, Pearl Harbor. And while they were talking, one of Roosevelt's top echelon men handed Roosevelt a note. He looked at this note and he turned it over to Churchill. 25,000 British soldiers were captured at Tobruk. Now I know Tobruk like I know this place right now. It's nothing there. It's about 175 miles west of Cairo. They had captured all those soldiers. So Churchill turns to Roosevelt. Now this is all in a computer. This is not what I'm saying. You all have to do is look at a computer. It's in there if you want to take time to look. Mr. President, we need help. And Roosevelt said, what can I do? As you know, we have a problem ourselves. He said, I need 300 Sherman tanks that are ready for desert warfare. 
Blue Road said, I'm going to get them to you right now. But we have to send you and a convoy. We can't take the chance of sending them over there without a convoy. Now I need fighter craft. We have to send that the same way we will take care of it. B-40s, B-38s, all kinds of ships like that. And we also need bombers. We have to destroy the supplies of all the Germans because without supplies, they cannot make it. That's our only hope. And Roosevelt says, we have a problem. We have a real problem. Just then, one of Roosevelt's top men came over and handed him a note. He turned to Churchill and he says, Mr. Prime Minister, I have 20 B-24s. Now, I don't know if you know what a B-24 is. It's the only four-engine bomber that the United States had. It's, it's very small compared to what we have today, but I would have trouble fitting into this room right now. They are parked in Burma. I will ship them immediately to Syria and Lebanon with the crews, but remember, I don't, all I have is the crews of these ships. I don't have any extra men. I don't have them right now. He says, and you'll have to hold the, the line at El Alamein. Now I have 500 airmen that are being trained in Barksdale Field, Louisiana, which is Shreveport, Louisiana. And that's where I come in. I was one of the 500. And we were trained, but he said, Mr. Prime Minister, it's going to take four to five months for us to get these men ready. He said, we'll do the best we can. Now, there's some good news and bad news. The English were not there. The English soldiers were not there. They were in England, ready for what the Germans were going to attack England and invade England. But they had in this English Eighth Army, the Aussies from Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, and from India, the Sikh and Gurkha Indians, a tremendous amount of fighters there. And all they have to do is hold this line. They have to hold this line until we can get the men. Meanwhile, we're in training. We're in training. Now let's go back to Palestine. I have a million Jews in Palestine. They weren't worried about the oil. They were worried about their families. They were worried about their children, their wives, their mothers and fathers, because they knew what was going to happen. And here's the bad part. In that article over there, it was given to me by Sister Prince. She said she got, I asked her today, she got out of Newsweek. And she said to me on a telephone in June, she said, Sydney, thank God she called me Sydney. She says, everything you've been talking about is true in that paper. Everything. There was a man, a German Nazi, by the name of Walter Ruff. Have you heard of this name, Walter Ruff? Yes. Well, usually when you talk to Walter Ruff, you talk about him, you're talking about the worst kind of a person in the world. This man invented the gas chamber where the trucks were, their big vans. They couldn't kill them fast enough in the regular gas chambers, so they built these vans and they killed them hundreds at a time. They were 150 miles west of, by the way, the general of the German army was Rommel, Irv Rommel, one of the best and now Rama was not a Nazi, he was just a general. They were in back of the lines. What were they going to do? As soon as the Germans got into Palestine, they were going to start the killing machines. And it would have been a second Holocaust. What's the difference? We're killing six million Jews right now, so what's another 500,000? 
And I heard the other day, telling from a Russian man, I thought there was 21 million killed in the entire wall. This man would know. He said there was 58 million men killed in that war. This gentleman is sitting right here. And you're talking about the Russians. Let me tell you something. They didn't have a picnic over there. In the Battle of Stalingrad, one million soldiers were killed. One million. It was the coldest winter they have had in Russia in 150 years. The bodies was frozen to the tanks. They couldn't be let out until the fall thaw, until the spring thaw came in. This is how cold it was. A million men. Now we go back to the Palestinian soldiers. They're a proud people. They had 30,000 ready to fight the Germans. So they go to the British Army. We want to join, but we want to join as a brigade. We will be under the orders of the general. By the way, the general was General Montgomery. Now he was supposed to be England's best general. Well, I want to tell you something. If he was the best one, I'd hate to see what the worst one was. Believe me. When they had the big fight, now we were just coming into Cairo when they had the big fight. And he was sleeping. And they told him that they had broken the German lines and he smiled and he went back to sleep. That's the kind of a general he was. Now we go back to the Palestinian soldiers. The English decided either you come in by yourselves or you don't come in at all. So they just said, no, we're proud people. So while Churchill was talking to Roosevelt, Roosevelt turned to Churchill. Now this is all in the computer, all in history. Mr. Prime Minister, I want you to do me a favor. He said, what is that? He said, you have 30,000 Jewish Palestinian brigade to want to fight the Germans, but they won't let them in the army. Why? He said, because you have a man by the name of Chamberlain. Have you heard the word Chamberlain? A British man, a real Nazi. Everything that the Jews tried to do, he would stamp his foot down. And Mr. Churchill said to Mr. Roosevelt, it will be done today. They will go into this army as a brigade under the rule of the British authorities. And that's how the Jewish, Palestinian Jewish Brigade started. Now, I have to tell you, our, our planes were parked pretty far away, so we, as the battle started and we started pushing the, the Germans back, now we call from Cairo all the way to Tunis in North Africa, it took us 18 months to get through there. And we were bombing the supply lines, we were bombing the Palestine oil fields, and by the way, these bombings on the Palestine oil fields was a 16 hour flight back and forth. And I can tell you what kind of a deal that is on a human body. <clears throat> we followed them. There was a fully in my outfit called Joe Stein from Brooklyn, a very religious man. He brought his towels, he brought his pillow with him. He wouldn't eat any meat. He bought eggs from the Arabs, and he lived on this. Eventually, after the war was over, he moved to Jerusalem. And 10 years ago, he passed away of cancer. But he was a wonderful man. And as we were going with the, with the convoy, the first time we stopped was a cemetery. Maybe the cemetery was there maybe two or three weeks. And we take a look, and there's the grave of Jewish soldiers with the Mount of David on it, the Jewish star. And I, we had a Jewish colonel. And I said to the colonel, I said, Sir, would it be possible for Joe and I to go over, or we don't have to go very far, and say the cottage, and he says, be my guest, but be very careful of minefields. 
and we went. And I had no trouble staying at college because I was saying it since I was 13 years old when my mother passed away at the age of 33 in 1930 and left three children. We said it. And I said to the general, to our colonel, I said, Colonel, is it all possible that when we stop for, to eat our rations, we stop by a cemetery so we can say cottage for the soldiers? And he said, if it's all possible, I will let it go. Just be very careful. And this is the story. Now, why am I telling you all this story? It's very simple. I was a kid. I was only 25 years old when I got into service. I didn't know what he was sending me. I had no idea. I didn't even know about Palestine. It was like everybody else. We knew nothing. But in the video, and I don't want to tell you about it, this is a video, I explained to the people why I'm telling this story. When you ask a person, oh, by the way, I have to tell you, this is important. 30,000 Palestinian Jews, so over 700 died, are buried in North Africa, over 700. They never got a chance to go back to the Holy Land, but they knew what they were fighting for. They were fighting for the lives of their children and their wives and their parents. So this is what the glory was about. So, as time went by, I, over here, when I, at last year, I became 90 years old, and for some reason or other, this young couple who everybody knows, Laurie and, and Jill, and Laurie and, uh, yeah. and Jeff last day, who everybody knows, <laughs> wonderful speakers, they are now on the East Coast, they heard about my story and they insisted that I tell this story, and I said, look, I'm 90 years old. What do you want from me? It's been locked up in my body for 65 years. You've got to tell it. Oh, and by the way, if you want to really get scared, we have tried for a year to find anybody alive from these 500 airmen. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. Go clap. I'm the only one. And when anybody says to me, you're a hero, I hate to hear that sound. I am not a hero. The people who died in this war, the six million Jews, all the people who died in this war, they are the real heroes. They are the ones that should be called the heroes. I was just doing a job. I've done a job, some does it easy, some do it hard. I had tough times and I had easy times, but we did a job. Everybody had a job to do. Before I start the video, I have to tell you about three different things that have happened here. First one is, in July of 1942, we arrived in Cairo. Uh, this was a month's trip around the hateful Gulf into the Sea of Madagascar, through the Red Sea, into Cairo. That night, uh, it's in the video, I won't tell, we had a talk with the commanding officer who gave us the whole lowdown. Then we got on an Egyptian train, which I don't want to ever remember. <laughs> We got on this train, it was a narrow gate, and we were on our way to Palestine so we could get to the B-24s as soon as possible. All of a sudden, everybody starts scratching. We're scratching like crazy. This, the plane was full of maggots and bed bugs. And they were told us not to scratch. Whatever you do, don't scratch. We will be in Palestine first, and we will change planes. And we went through a hell of a night that night. But we were kids, we were strong, we could handle it. And we got off this plane and they put us into this concert hut, made us get stark naked. 
and they gave us buzz bombs that we sprayed ourselves with, sprayed all our clothes, everything with it. Then they came and they put powder, all kinds of powder over our bodies. And they kept saying, don't scratch, you'll get an infection. And we got on an Israel, on a, on a Palestinian train. And then we all fell asleep. Nothing about us. Our first stop and only stop in Palestine was Haifa. Now I'm telling you something. I won't repeat what's in the video, what we saw on our way to over there. We had a lot of fellas from the south in our outfit, what you call rednecks. And we had a lot of fellas from the east. And I'll tell you, things didn't go too smooth. And when they saw a Jew or a black man, I don't have to tell you what they thought. I was called every name in a book, but never did I ever stand up. I wasn't, I wasn't a coward, but I wasn't going to get myself killed for something like that. And I just took it. We all took it. So we get off of this train, and sure enough, beautiful, place. place is only 75 years old and things are really moving around and there's Palestinian soldiers there and they give us something to eat and they give us a soda. It's called pop and on the top of the bottle was the same thing that had on the seltzer bottle where you would flip it up and then of course they could reuse it again. And it wasn't cold but it wasn't bad and we drank that. One of these redneck guys, who everybody tried to stay away from, walks up to this Arab, and I was right close by, and he turns to the Arab and he says, you speak English? And the Arab, and the Arab nodded his head. He points to me and he says, him Jew. And the Arab looks at me, and with his right hand, he goes like this. That means he wants to cut my throat. Well, my father didn't raise a fool. This guy weighed 270 pounds, six foot three, no way. I turned around and I looked him in the eye. I was about a foot away from him. And I just looked at him and stared at him for 30 seconds. And finally, the ab turned and walked away. This Palestinian soldier got up to me and said, Carpool, did you learn anything? I said, yes, I did. But what did you learn? I learned never to turn my back on an arrow. And this is what I did. That's my first story. My second story is about the Yom Kippur War. A lot of people may know this, and a lot of people don't. Palestinian authorities knew. By that time, they were already Israelis. They knew that the Arabs were going to attack on Yom Kippur, but they didn't know where or what time. So everybody that was in this in Israel knew, and all soldiers knew, that if the alarm sounded, they had to be at a certain spot. Well, the attack started. And these soldiers started going up and down the streets of Jerusalem, going to their place. And they passed a bunch of Hasidic Jews walking, going to shul with their black coats and everything. Instead of them getting up there and cheering to the soldiers, they pick up rocks and throw them at the soldiers and cuss them out because they are going to fight the, the, the Germans on, your, on the Arabs on your own Kippur. To me, that got to me. To me, that got to me. I couldn't believe it that. So us Jews, have a problem. Us Jews have a real problem. And my third story is a sad one. A few years back in Jerusalem, a bus of children, over 30, was on this bus going to school. And some way or other, this Arab woman got on the bus. Nobody knew she was a terrorist. She got in the middle of the bus, 
blew herself up, killed every child on that bus. And those who didn't die from the blast, they were burned to death. Now, here's the bad part. The, the Arab terrorist who caused this sent a check for $100,000 to the family that did the killing. Why $100,000? Because the more Jews you kill, the more money you get. Now it's all in the computer. It's all there. You don't have to believe me. It's all there. So you know what this flag means to us. Because on all three sides, the Israelis are tied in. Everybody hates us. The ones that hate them hate us in America. The same ones hate us, and we have to go, but they have to change themselves. They have to get, you have to live with all people. You have to live with them. These are the three stories that I want to say. Now, before I start the video, I want to tell you, I'm going to go back 3,500 years to the year of Moses. God decided it was time that the Hebrews should not be slaves anymore. <coughs> and you know the story. They got them out of Egypt, got them to the Red Sea. Then they got and got the Ten Commandments. And when he comes down from the Ten Commandments, they're out there praying to a golden calf. He said to Moses, these people are not worthy of going in the Holy Land. And they didn't go in. And then when they got to the Holy Land, there was a problem between Moses and God. And what God said to Moses, you cannot go to the Holy Land. And they didn't. Now we'll go back 3,500 years to what time? The Palestinian Jewish Brigade, they never, the 700 that died, they never got back to the Holy Land. 1,100 miles from Cairo to Tunis, they're lined up, and you don't have any problem finding them, because they all got the Star of David. But here's what gets me more than anything. I go to the J five days a week to work out, and there's a lot of sobbers over there. And when I say to the sobbers, have you ever heard of the Jewish brigade? And they look at you like they're talking a different language. Something is wrong. Something is definitely wrong. Because if you don't teach the children, how will they know? How will they know? So I say to you, this is the whole story. And I hope there's some changes made. So what I want you to do, we're going to show the video. video. Just listen to what the man says. Don't worry about who left, who's there. He's talking of his heart. And I got to tell you, I broke down a few times. And I'll talk about that later on. I just want to tell you very quickly, there's something that happened in Tunis two days before I went to Italy that took me from the worst of my time in the, in the Army to the best of my time in the Army. And I will speak about that. So all I do, you sit and relax, and you watch the video, and we hope that you will understand what I'm talking about. Thank you. I have to introduce the people who are involved with this thing. A woman who came to me, who went to the, I mean to the Jewish War Veterans and to the Jewish Federation, the Holocaust Center. She went to the Holocaust Center. And she took me under her wing, and she told me what to do. And I want to tell you something. If you know what an Isakai is in Jewish, to those who don't know, that's the angel of God. And then she said to me in December, I'm going away with my husband for the winter, 
I'm going to turn you over to a person, another person, and she will know how to handle this because this is important to talk to. And this person calling me. Now, before I get to this person, I would like to call this one, the first one up, Sister Prince. Would you please come up for just a moment, please? Please. She has to have, yeah, she has to have the iron of God. Now, before I talk to her one more, I have to tell you, being at this lake, I got a citation from the general of the of the 8th Air Force in 1944 of June. You'll come out here after the show is over and you'll see the pictures. We built a theater. I didn't build it. I, I was the one that planned the theater for 6,000 soldiers. And this was my job. And we had to do it in seven days because we had a USO show coming. And I found out later it was belly dances from Cairo. <laughs> There's a story behind that too, I'll tell you. But anyway, before this, they had the show, and before this show started, they called me up, and I didn't expect it, the general, and there was nothing but generals over there. And I had no idea what they wanted to do to me. And he had this thing in his hand. Now before I tell you about it, it was through my wife. We found it, we lost it, we couldn't find it. We went through the entire apartment, we tore the apartment apart, we couldn't find it. We went to the, uh, the record center on Page Avenue, there was a fire there and they lost it, they don't know what happened to it. We went to the bank and sure enough at the bottom of the box, there it was, the original copy gave to me by the General of the 8th Air Force. I give you the honor to please to read this to, to, to the people here. It, it is an honor, but I, I just want to say one thing before. When I first met Sidney and I, we had an interview and then um, he told me, and this was the audio, this wasn't mm -hmm. the, the video that um, uh, Marcy Rosenberg made. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, well anyway, it, it was so fascinating, and, and he was so dedicated that after I interviewed him, I, I went home and I couldn't get him out of my mind. <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> and I called him back and I said, I want to do this again. I want to talk with you again. And during that interview, he really was so dedicated to wanting to tell this story that he he wanted to do it on video, and that's when I, I called Marcy and I said, will you do me a favor? And she said, absolutely. And so that's really how it came about. So I will, I will read you this. This is from Headquarters, 449th Bombardment Group, APO 520, U.S. Army. And this is July 25th, 1944. And the subject is commendation to Commanding Officer 348th Service Squadron, 62nd Service Group. Because of his energy and ingenuity in supervising the construction of the base theater, Corporal Sidney Rosen, 170-34543, Air Corps, is to be commended, commended. Prior to June of this year, this group did not possess a theater of any type other than a small squadron mess hall. With several thousand personnel on the field, the situation presented a, mor a morale problem of considerable magnitude. Upon the, upon the suggestion of this headquarters, the 348th Service Squadron and Company A, the, one, the, one, the 1898 8th Engineer Battalion, proceeded to construct a worthwhile open-air theater. The project was placed under the supervision of Corporal Rosen, who is the base projectionist. A hangar was cleared of bomb debris. Seats for 3,000 people were placed therein. A stone projection booth was constructed as well as a stone generator house. A standard-sized screen was built, and through considerable effort, 
a stage complete with dressing rooms was built. Today, movies and USO shows play to a full house, and the officers and enlisted men of every unit on this field have been generous in their appreciative praise of the theater. Through his untiring efforts and skill, Corporal Rosen has reflected great credit, credit upon himself and the Army Air Forces. This is from Ch Thomas J. Gent, Jr., Lieutenant Colonel, Air Corps, Commanding. Thank you. Now you know what I'm proud of, to be able to make these boys happy because nobody knows how these boys were when they come off of that airplane. 16 hours on an airplane, a lot of them had to be helped off. They weren't wounded, but when you're in an airplane that long, your legs are wobbly. You have very little control of your equilibrium. And these guys, and that's why they only did 25 missions because the body couldn't do any more than that. Now, I can tell you, after this presented was to me, I never had a problem with anybody. No problem whatsoever. They were crazy about me, and all they asked me was, what are we going to have tonight for the movie? Because this is all they had. As bad as they were when they come off of that airplane, they couldn't lay down and go to sleep. They were too tensed up. So they would go to the outside theater two, two and a half hours before the show started and sit down and just talk. And when the movie came on, they didn't care what kind of movie it was. They wanted to see this movie. So I'm proud of that. Now, now I want to come to my pride and joy. Well, and I want to tell you something before I forget. Without my wife, none of this would happen. Not at all. Because she stuck with me all the way through. And I want to appreciate it. And I didn't make a mistake when I married her, believe me. <laughs> now I'm going to call on somebody. I don't know what. God has a, a thing when he has somebody born. They're here for a reason. I want to introduce to you one of my best friends. <laughs> one I love as long as I'm in this world. She was wonderful. And when it's time when I broke down, she grabbed my right arm. And I want to tell you something. When she grabbed my right arm, I stopped crying. <laughs> this is going to be better than penicillin. <laughs> it's got to be. It's amazing. Whatever she does, I just stop. I mean, if I bump my toe, I would like you to grab my hand so I can stop crying. You know how it is. But anyway, I want to introduce you to the second love of my life, or the third, <laughs> I have to forget my daughter, Marcia Levinson Rosenberg, please. Now I have to tell you about this woman here. I know her, oh God, so 40 years too soon. <laughs> I say she has to have a body of iron to be able to go through and interview the Holocaust survivors. And one story is worse than another. And to be able to do that, and she just come back from a trip to Poland, which I told her in the middle of the winter, no way, and she said, I had to go, but I should have taken your advice. She is one person out of this world. And she, and I like when she left, she had to go to see her father who was being operated on and she said, I'll be back. And she came back and she says, you've got six days to get your speech ready. <laughs> and I didn't sleep for six days. <laughs> and as I wrote all those notices in there, I, I said, I can't talk like this. There's no way. People don't want me to read from these notes. But I didn't look at the notes. Once I put it down, that was it. And long as she was staring me in the face. And we have a cameraman by the name of Larry. He's Italian, isn't he? It's the first time we ever saw Italian cry. 
he's not here today because he has some kind of an affair with his family. And these are real professional people. I want to introduce you to Marcia Levinson Rosenberg. You know, meeting Sydney was, was so important, and his story is so important, and that's why we're here today because history is so important, and what's happened to the Jewish people is so important, and what's happened in Israel. And if everyone has the kind of heart that Sydney has, it's going to be a better world because that's the story we're telling. That's what we're saying. Let's love each other. Let's be good to each other. Let's learn from the tragedy that has happened in this world. And let's all make it a better world to live in. Thank you. Before I have my closing things, I want to talk to the Holocaust survivors. We're all here or members of the Sheriff Zedek. We had a rabbi, Arnold Ashley, who died a young man a few years ago and left a wife and children. He wrote a book. It was called, Don't Cry For Me. He knew he wasn't going to live very long, but he wrote this book. I'm sorry to say I never read it, but I'm going to read it because to read it because the family has said they will give me a copy. And I want to tell you something. He said, don't cry for me. And I say to the people that are Survivors, don't cry for them. They're in a better place. And I believe, and so help me, I believe with all my soul, that God gave us the promised land 3,500 years ago. It was the promised land while we were alive. The promised land that he gives us now is the one where we go when we're dead. Now, there's one story I have to tell you. Do I have time? No. Uh, okay. I have a videotape. I got it over 50 years ago. Where I got it from, I have no idea. I turn it over to Marcia, and she's having it made into a DVD. And there's something special about this. Every year, I sit down, and I did a week ago today, Watch this tape. It's two hours and fifty, two hours and five, and a thirty minutes long. It's called "Death Camps and Genocide." You know what? It's the worst thing you ever see in your life. The worst. I'm tired of crying. I watch it, and as I saw General Eisenhower standing there in the midst of all the bodies, with his hands on his hips. And you can see his face on his face saying, I can't believe what I'm seeing. I can't believe what I'm seeing. Now, something happened in Italy about a week and a half before I left Italy to come back to the United States. I knew a Jewish family that was in Toronto, Italy, which is right too far from the heel. And I used to bring them a few things because they were poor people. I went there to say goodbye to them. And there was two young men in their early 20s. They said they were early 20s. They looked like early 70s. They had escaped in 1944. Or, uh, no, it was 1945 of February. They escaped from Buchenwald and another camp, which I don't remember. And you, when you talk to these men, or talk to any survivor, you got to be careful the way you talk. Because if you talk and say something that you didn't mean to say, they will completely stop. They will not want to tell you. They've, they've seen too much in their life. So I talked to them, and they only spoke Yiddish. They spoke Russian and Polish. And also, they spoke uh, uh, some German, but they spoke Yiddish. And I spoke Yiddish, because I lived with my grandmother and grandfather. 
And I said to them, I said, tell me, I'd like to speak to the people when I go back home to tell them what you're going through. Somebody has to know. The one gentleman turned to the other gentleman and he says in Jewish, so him zoom, that means shall I tell him? And the other one says, can't zoom, that means you can tell him. There was 13 reels of film shot, shot by the American, British, Russians, and two by Germans. Horrible films. And the Holocaust has got most of them. But they don't have this one, the one that I've got. Two of these films, the two last reels, have never been found. Somebody's got them because they don't want to show them because something terrible happened there. Even a, you couldn't think of a human being being like this. Something terrible happened. I have all 11 reels on this thing. And when I get it from Marcy, if people want to see it, I'll be more than happy to. And before I say any more, I want to tell you that as long as I have breath in my body, Love in my body. I will talk to any group about this and show this video and answer any question because now it's getting late and I don't want to do that. But I want to tell you about these pictures right here. Those were taken with a $2 camera that I bought at Kansas Drugstore in Wellston. <coughs> and $2 at that time was a day's wages for me. And I made all these pictures, and I have oodles of them, but my daughter has them all, and she had these in large. When the show is over, if you want to come up here, I'll be glad to answer any question here that you want, tell you what they are, because there's a lot more stories there, but I don't want to keep you here. Now I want to tell you about the last two reels. I would like to tell some more. I will, I will. But it's getting late. I want to make <laughs> the two reels shows a male guard in the camp and a female guard in the camp. All these people around them are skin and bone. They're fat and sloppy. And they're standing there and they're holding two children. Each one has a child. And they're by the ovens. And they open up the oven and throw both children into the oven. Turn around, walk away and smile and talk in German. And I said to this man, this was it when in the film. I cannot, I can prove everything I've been talking about today, but I can't approve that. So, come your kipper of this last year at the Sheriff Senate, we had an intermission and we were sitting there, and I don't walk around. Who comes up is Sir Wolf, right here. Sits down, talks to my wife. And I said I was gonna tell her this story, and my wife hollered at me, don't tell it to her. And I said, I have to tell it to her. I have to know something. And I tell her this story. And with all the crying that she has done, with all the crying, she still had some tears left. And I says, is this possible? And you know what Sarah said to me? You can believe it. You can believe it. And this is what happened. The world has got to change. We cannot continue this way. And that's why I say, you have to teach the children the children have to learn, our rabbis and our Hebrew school teachers have to spend at least an hour or so or two a week to teach the children to know what happened to their forefathers before because eventually they're going to forget. 9,000 American soldiers are dying every day. Every day somebody from the Holocaust is dying. 
sooner or later, they won't be here anymore. So I say to you, to all the soldiers, the one from uh, from the Battle of Pearl Harbor, Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, the Solomon Islands, also to the Philippine Islands, to the Coral Sea, Midway, I may for him forget, to the Battle of Normandy, day one, and to the Battle of the Belge, which was a disaster. 15,000 soldiers died because they wouldn't give the gas to Patton to clean them up, and to Anzio, and to the British 8th Army, who stood there and fought the Germans, and to the 30,000 Palestinian Jews, and seven who gave their lives so their families could live in peace and harmony and to the 500 Americans, which I was one, went across the ocean. And I have to tell you, I found out later, there was two ships waiting to go across the ocean if we didn't make it. They had to go. And I say to all of them, these are your history. This is your, the people that did it all. And I want all the people to stand up all over who want Israel to be, Israel to be destroyed and be destroyed in the United States. I want to say to you all, two words, never again, never again. Thank you very much.